Welcome back to Tales from the Power Age, and tonight we are talking 1982. Now, a lot happened in 1982. Ozzy Osbourne bit the head off a bat. The uh, Falklands War started, <laughs> and there was a new Prince born. But we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about heavy metal and rock albums from the year 1982. So we've curated 12 of the best. Um, you may or may not disagree. If you agree or disagree, please get involved. Like, comment, please subscribe, hit the house bell. Just get involved and tell us what you think. Uh, and thanks for all of you that have got involved so, uh, so far, particularly to our uh, to our audience on Twitter who are really engaged in terms of some of the stuff. So really appreciate that, guys. You're brilliant. So 1982. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, good. There Cheers. Go. All good, mate. Okay. So just a reminder, if you've never seen this before, the way this works is that we uh, we present three of the best, each of us, from that year. We talk about what that album means to us, why we like it so much. A couple of things that we haven't added. There's no compilation albums in these episodes, although that will follow, I promise you. And there are no live albums. But uh, we're really looking forward to talking about No Sleep to Hammersmith at some point, I promise you. So... Uh, that will come. But as it is, it's 1982, and uh, we're going to kick off tonight with Gav. So over to you, mate. Okay. First of my pitches. Well, what can you say about Screaming Vengeance? Just a classic return to form for the Mighty Priest. Now, they had a bit of a disappointing album before then, uh, with Point of Entry, but they came back heavy as hell. Screaming for Vengeance. Um, there's not really a weak song on this bad boy um the cover is uh, no well not really i don't think so not compared with some of their other albums anyway this is the one i've got a poster in this one as well this doesn't even say oh, on the front you got the inner cover as well do you want to just show that yeah one? yeah it's so image wise for me this was coming into their perfect that period, look at that yeah, absolutely look. epic and uh the poster is brilliant i mean what an iconic Im image on the front there from uh Doug Johnson, who would go on to do Defenders and Turbo as well. How many songs still feature in the preset? Quite a few. The Hellion, Electric Eye, obviously, Riding on the Wind. You've got another thing coming, Devil's Child. You know, what more do you need? Absolute classics, every one of them. And I think consistent all the way through. I think one, just one single. You've got another thing coming, which is the picture disc there. And um, I think also like other albums i'm going to mention an important album as far as breaking them in america um this was uh, they started getting mega huge uh from this point on it even did the us festival which was one of the biggest rock festivals of all time so yeah that's judas priest from my side you boys got anything to say uh well it's certainly my favorite priest album um so good to see you both showing that i've got it down there in the collection it's absolutely fantastic I just echo everything you said, riding on the wind, but the, and the commerciality of that, you've got another yeah. thing coming. Boom. Stratospheric one in the States. It's yeah. like massive. Yeah, great record. It's okay. a great record, but definitely not my favourite. My favourite might be coming up in a, in another couple of years or maybe even one year. Never know. <laughs> but Screaming for Vengeance, the song, it was a heavy... Oh, yeah. The, heavy the song dose itself, of metal at the time. Mental. Yeah. Fast and loads of guitars, loads of solos. Precursor to Painkiller. So this is my next one. I mean, I've been a lucky boy this time around because uh, Iron Maiden, classic album. Obviously, Bruce's debut with the band. Um, one of the best album covers and iconic covers of all time. Sorry to keep going on about the album covers. That's a reissue. And there was, uh, I know that they were annoyed when the, first, when the album actually came out in the UK because it was too blue. And so they made it much blacker going forward we've got the old original merch sheet there with the original release so yeah again uh, i think we've mentioned this on another pod they um they rushed it out so uh it wasn't finished steve harris wasn't happy that gangland was on there and gangland actually had a solo missing because they just mixed it um wrong or the final mix wasn't the correct mix um he wanted total eclipse on it 
um, which they did eventually substitute on the re-release. We're, we're not really in favour of that decision. I think Gangland's better than Total Eclipse, personally. When you've got, uh, again, album uh, tracks that are still in the set today, you know, Children of the Damned, Prisoner, Acacia Avenue, obviously Number of the Beast, Run to the Hills with the main singles. Hello Be Thy Name, you know, they're all there. These driven by the artwork at the time, of course. But Bruce Dickinson, talk about coming on board and saying, this is me, aren't I much better than the last guy as far as vocal range and, you know, harmonies and all that kind of stuff. Enough to break the states, to, to your point earlier, Jam on Priest. This album was controversial as well because of the kind of um, satanic worshipping nonsense. So it got him a lot of attention over there. You know, still stands up today as a, a classic Maiden album. This, I, I had this on the original cassette, and you remember the That's old Walkman, remember the old Walkmans with the with the orange um, sponge around the. Uh, That's how I first uh, listened to this uh, album was on on tape. Yeah, to all the time. I thought it was an absolutely fantastic album. Spine tingling listening to Number of the Beast and then Run to the Hill straight afterwards. Um, yeah, it's a super record. It really is. And very that much must... underrated 22 Acacia Avenue, which is a yeah, brilliant song. Great song, yeah. And brilliant. the prisoner revisiting that this year in the future, this this tour that we've just seen. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. immense, yeah. isn't it? it just blew Play me away. So good to hear it. So, yeah, really strong album. And this one is, um, this one's signed. And uh, I was trying to show you, but uh, our old mate Nico got in on the act as well. I don't know why, but he uh, <laughs> just wants to sign and it, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's worth mentioning Clive Burr. What an amazing yeah. performance on this album. What an unusual drumming style he's got. You know, that kind of rolling, galloping feel that he's got. It's very unusual, very kind of jazzy compared with a straight ahead rocker. Brilliant playing. Next up is one that's extremely close to my heart. There's not much you can say about this. Is This is Magnum, Chase the Dragon, for anyone listening. Classic album cover again. I mean, those were the days for album covers. This was uh, marked the debut of Mark Stanway on keyboards, replacing Richard Bailey, and a much tougher sound. Actually recorded around the, uh, the same time as the live album, Marauder, but took two years to be released. Such a heavy, bassy, well-produced album, in my opinion. Jeff Glicksman was the guy that produced it, and uh, famous for doing Kansas, which was a bit softer than this, but then went on to do Saxon, Hour on the Glory which again is a bassy, meaty production, um, recorded in London and then uh, off to the States for mixing, Atlanta, to Jeff's own studio. And the songs on here, again, in the set today, you've got The Spirit, uh, Soldier of the Line, Sacred Hour, of course, um, just a bunch of classic songs. Lights Burned Out was the only single off this album, actually, just to show you, I don't know if you can make it out there, this one's signed by signed by Tony, Bob and Mark. And then I took this one when we went to see them. So randomly, it's got um, Jim Simpson and Eddie George signing it, which is a bit random. But uh, the single off the album, the only one, typical record company thinking the ballad should be the single. So that's the uh, the lights burned out with the free pendant. And uh, you... no, no skimping on exactly the same artwork on <laughs> Yeah, on exactly. The single yeah. cover. <laughs> Yeah, so they had a little proof of purchase that you could send off for a a little uh, pendant, which I've still got. I remember when you and then it. the same year, not associated with the album, was this classic, which is another everyone oh, loves yes. Back to Earth. So uh, mm -hmm. it was a it was a good era for them, and uh, and it didn't stop there. So we we'll, we'll be mentioning Magnum again in the future. And they've gone back to that logo. They have, yeah, yeah, quite correctly. <laughs> The, the other thing is, well, I didn't know they've been going to, since 1972 until the other day. Yeah. They've actually been going longer than ACDC. Yeah, not, not really as Magnum, though. They, Bob, and, Bob and Tony were together yeah. um, in covers bands and doing various pub stuff. But, yeah, they've been going ages. So, well, yeah, it, anything to add, boys? Yeah, I mean, I bought, I bought this on, on cassette because I was listening and, and I remember Gav seeing that I had the, the cassette and saying, oh, hold on, hold on a minute. We're at school. I'm the Magnum fan. I haven't got, I'll buy it off you. I went, well, no, I really like it. Said, no, but I'm so into Magnum. So I, I don't the, remember that. Yeah, in the end, I had to sell it to him for what I bought because otherwise he just wouldn't stop going on because he didn't have it. And I was like, okay, okay, okay. Gav's the collector 
Alas, it makes you feel better. I've still got it. 1982, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I'm going to go out and get the vinyl. But yeah, to crack, the only thing we didn't mention, which is probably the only song on there, that is The Teacher, which is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, live, when we seeing them live around this time, 83, and that was, it was, they were superb. 83, they were still playing a few of these back then, weren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Soldier and then to went on to support Ozzy in the States. Same record label. Gab, Gab was the first person I connected with at school, and uh, this is the first album uh, he played to me on a little mono tape deck that we uh, that we took into school. Your little silver played, one, like, yeah, that one. <laughs> played it in uh, on the playground, but yeah, I mean, what a fantastic album! And it got me so into this band, and we went on to see him, I don't know, ten, eleven times in the ensuing two or three years. Yeah, um, but, uh, this is just fantastic stuff. Certainly well. So that's my solid pitch for three incredibly solid albums. Good stuff. Right, so we're on to Gappy now. Over to you, mate. Yeah, my first one, Kiss, Creatures of the Night. Um, we touched on Kiss in our last uh, uh, year's pod with The Elder. Um, and as we all know, it didn't, uh, didn't do too well anywhere. Yeah, Gav's got it there. I've got, actually got the... Uh, the, the reissue which i bought recently yeah that's brilliant. Is absolutely yeah. brilliant with the glowing eyes it's absolutely fantastic this record um uh very very different from the elder obviously um there was a lot more um uh heavier songs on it they wanted to go back to a heavier sound um you've got a picture of ace on the front cover there uh, who doesn't actually feature on the album at all Anyway, I, I, I saw this and uh, yeah, it, it's just a fantastic album. There's a lot of different things on this album. There's a lot of different guitar players on it. I mean, Vinnie Vincent did a lot of playing. Didn't do all the guitar solos by any means. There was a couple of other guitar players that did some solos and some uh, full guitar tracks. And Gene Simmons didn't play bass on all of it either. A couple of uh, different guys played bass on a couple of the tracks. We've had this in a quiz that we've done before that um, a Canadian fellow by the name of Brian Adams, actually uh, wrote a couple of the songs on this album, or co-wrote them with Jim Valance. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it was, uh, what was it, War Machine and uh, Rock and Roll Hell. That's it. Rock Got all the hell. songs on this album. It's, it's such a great album. Really, really fantastic. And a real return to form for um, what most KISS fans thought was uh, a very poor effort in the previous year. Uh, this record, we covered this, as we say, if you look at our other pods, we've got a couple of Kiss pods that I think you probably you will like a lot. This record, whether it's because the Elder was come before, this didn't get greeted that well commercially. It wasn't a massive success. But this record for me, I love it loud and I still love you. Those two songs, if I can hear them now, it just reminds me of seeing them live in 83. They're two awesome songs, massively iconic, and I just love them. And that carry, they carry the record really well for me. And I don't know if it, on the uh, certainly on the new one, I've got the new one as well, Gappy. The, the eyes light up in the night, don't they? <laughs> on the cover, yeah. I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've got the lights it's on. Really excellent. You think you've got cats in the room looking at you? Yeah, it's, it's really effective, isn't it? It's really yeah. good. Awesome. Yeah. Anyway, and the drum sound is totally different on the uh, on the reissue as well. It was it was like it was recorded in a toilet on the first album, but uh, on the original release. But the drum sound is is immense on the on the reissue. Brilliant. Okay, good. Next one. For the next one. Yeah, so we got Y&T with Black Tiger. Um, I came to Y&T a bit late. I'd, um, I'd, uh, uh, Jammy got me into Y&T with uh, Mean Street when that came out a year after this. But going back to this album, first album with the iconic Y&T logo after Earthshaker previously. And it's the first album with uh, a cover art by uh, John Taylor Dismukes or something. And he went on to do... Mean Streak and uh, oh, In Rock okay. We Trust, which was the one after Mean Streak. Cool. Great album, uh, very short. And uh, a lot of people said after Earthshaker, it wasn't a very good album. There's some great standout tracks on this one. Open Fire, Forever, mm -hmm. Black Tiger. Yeah, can't say much more about it, really. Anyone? Just they were touring with DC, basically DC around this time, and that got them noticed very much. Uh, and again, it's a good album. But yeah, really like, really, I'm a big Wine T fan. They played Oxford around this time because my brother went to see them and he loved them. So they did a, they did a headlining tour as well. Yeah. Maybe the year after. Yeah, I think it was 83. If you're right, yeah. Gav, I'm pretty sure. I caught them in 83 at Oxford. 3rd yeah, of December. Maybe. That's what I'm thinking of, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Next one. Oh, the iconic. The album that started a genre. 
<laughs> what a fantastic band. Again, I didn't get into them until uh, a friend of ours who was uh, mentioned previously called Borlo, uh, Andy, he got me into Venom when At War With Satan came out uh, next year. But I went back to this album and uh, and bought it. I bought it on picture disc, which I've uh, I've got here in a ridiculous cover. But here we go. There it is. And I remember. Uh, there we go. Remember walking no, around Ox Oxford City Centre after I'd bought this uh, with uh, with the demon on full display and getting so much grief from people around me because I had my inverted cross, which I had uh, at the time as well, wearing around my neck. That proudly, was last Saturday afternoon. Which proudly you, as a 14 year old. <laughs> but, I mean, look yeah. at that cover. I mean, it's it so, so good. Yeah. And as you say, it's it's the album that spawned a, a genre um, and uh, from uh, apparently people that couldn't actually play their instruments, which is utter bollocks, but there you go. Yeah, uh, Probably is. the fastest ever song, black metal, the song which uh, uh, in is introduced into the album. Uh, up to this point, I don't think there's been a faster heavy metal song uh, at all, so it probably spawned thrash metal or speed mm -hmm. metal or whatever you want to call it as well. Yeah. And uh, there's some standout tracks on this song, mm -hmm. Black Metal, uh, Buried Alive, Raise the Dead, Teacher's Pet, uh, Countess Bathory, Don't Burn the Witch. And uh, Cronus had the foresight to put a little snippet of the next album at the end of uh, Don't Burn the Witch, which is the last song on the album, which was at war with Satan. No one had ever done anything like that before, just as a little taster of what you were going to go into for the next uh, for the next album, it's marketing genius back then. It's absolutely fantastic, and look at that logo as well. Well, you can't say anything more about this band. They were they were fantastic. My mum and my nan, who lived with us at the time, absolutely detested this stuff. They could put up with ACDC and Van Halen, but when, when Venom went on the decks, that was it. There was crying, wailing, everything, and I I, I loved it at the time because being a Holy rebellious God. teenager, I didn't really care too much. Uh, yeah, absolutely love this album. I know you guys probably don't have much to say on this one because it's pretty much only me and Borlo that were into this band at the time, but mm. I absolutely adore it. My uh, my re recollection is just you and Borlo being mad about it. And and then I think it probably was a year later, maybe two, they're actually on the TV. They had a live at Hammersmith thing. And I could just couldn't believe how much pyro they had for, yeah. for those days. You know, I wasn't, the music was good. But I was just looking at the stage show, thinking this is this That's is dark so kiss. You know, yeah. they were definitely trailblazers, right? That appealed to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good. Okay, excellent. So that's me. Good. So Jamo, it's me. Oh gosh, look at that eye of the tiger. Oh, what a heavy one. metal show. It, it most certainly is. Um, I got Another this tiger. I got this record for Christmas in 1982. Uh, this is one of my favourite, favourite bands. Uh, we've harped on before about the American Heartbeat uh, compilation album that came out that had all of the AOR acts on it. Um, Eye of the Tiger by Survival was on it and the American Heartbeat, both of which feature on here. Uh, but there's so much more to Survivor. The rest of the tracks on this record are absolutely superb. This has my, uh, the guitarist Frankie Sullivan is in my top three guitarists ever in my life, which is putting it in pretty high, high esteemed company. Fantastic, um, mate. You can't knock him. His tone and his playing is just superlative, and I adore him. So, yeah. On a Telecaster. Uh, yeah. He's just, and he, he cracks open a Les Paul occasionally, but he's just, it's brilliant. It's a great record. It's, there's so much more to Survivor than the song Eye of the Good Tiger. Yeah. You're not yeah. wrong. They are one of the only bands that I've actually, I've never got to see. Uh, Gaps and I, we had tickets to see them in 2014. They were coming over with Jimmy, Jimmy and um, the other original lead singer. Dave Bickler. Oh, yeah, Dave Bickler. Unfortunately, uh, Jimmy passed away. So, of course, the tour wasn't wasn't continued and it was cancelled. So it, really, it was such a shame. Uh, but they live on with me. I've got all their records on CD <laughs> and on vinyl. Um, and, yeah, they're brilliant. I don't think you boys have much to add to this, but maybe Gappy, but anything else to add? Best AOR band ever to have walked the earth, in my opinion. And I've only just noticed now, <laughs> looking at that, that, that guys are actually mm. in the eyes of the tiger. I've never <laughs> noticed that before in my life. <laughs> That's Fair brilliant. Enough. There's so many good songs on this album. I listened yeah. to it recently and cried my eyes out to the ballads. It's, it's, oh, it's immense. Absolutely immense. No, There's some chunky record. riffs on there as well, aren't there? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Hesitation yeah. Dance uh, opens rather nicely. You think, oh, hello. 
And do you know um, what? A, what a gig getting the song for the Rocky film as well. I mean that they must have shifted so many. Sing. I mean, I've got yeah. the single. I've got the Eye of the Tiger single down there. Still. It's only because Queen wouldn't let them have um, the another one bites the dust. Oh, but okay. Queen wouldn't let them have it, so oh, they took no. uh, they took Eye of the Tiger instead. Good to know. Thank you, Gav. And my next one on the same vein, we've got Scorpions with Black Hat. Oh, scorpions were to me i think what magnum were to gav scorpions were, were one of one of my earliest loves at the time early doors gap here i knew liked scorpions because he had lonesome crow randomly you remember you gap, so only, yeah, yeah, I do, indeed. So we connected big time over the scorpions but the, when this record came out um it's just massive um, for me, this this opened up like like with Judas Priest. We said with Scream for Vengeance, Blackout did similar. Um, I think for Scorpions, and they went stratospheric off the back of this. And I, this record, I remember I got a family tale. We were at the dinner table. And I remember my dad. Um, he was a great music lover. Uh, Barry Manilow, Shirley Bassey, that type of thing. Loved his music. And I remember him sitting at the dinner table with this record in his hand. My brother had brought it home. <laughs> and he had them to the cover. I went, what is this? What is this cover? Has he got four? What is this rubbish? And he took the inner sleeve out and he started reading it and he went, blackout. I really had a blackout. Blackout. I really had a blackout. Blackout. Right. He read the, 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 the lyrics to the whole of the chorus. And he looks, he went, my brother, Kevin, he went, it's brilliant, isn't it? absolutely brilliant i just remember him saying how great it was my dad and and it was and it wasn't down to the lyrical content it was just brilliant the riffs on this were out of this world um anyone got anything to add well it's the best guitar sound i'd ever heard up to this point absolutely yeah. fantastic arizona with two dueling guitars in uh, in either speaker playing different riffs uh the, yeah everything on this album blackout the song is is fantastic um it's one of the albums that actually got ruined in the in the great flood that I had, and it's now warped. So I need to buy another one. I had it on first press, um, but I haven't got it anymore, so I can't even play it anymore on vinyl. But I mean, I mean, I, and I I actually thought that was a, a picture of Rudolph on the front, but it's actually a self portrait by the artist. I can't remember his name because it really does look like Rudolph Schenker, doesn't yeah, well, it? Well, cool, it? Yeah. No, nah, yeah. it's, it's actually a self portrait. I can't remember the guy's name, oh. but yeah, it's yeah. Just a fantastic album. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Brilliant cover and an, an excellent heavy metal album, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's, and it still sounds, sounds amazing today. It does. doesn't save you. Which leads me on to my final choice. Van Halen, Diver Down. We've got some cracking. What this a, is mad. What this, a, year, this year of records is absolutely mental. Uh, for me, uh, Van Halen, I, had a, I did a mixtape of Van Halen, a, a mixtape, basically. It was this album plus Van Halen and Van Halen 2. So this th formed a third of a, of, a, of a massive chunk of my music listening life on a cassette. Um, and it's just awesome. The guitar, the, the tone, the guitar tone on this, um, everything about it. I didn't know there were covers on it. I didn't know there were covers. I used to hear songs after later on and I'd go, oh, what they've ruined this Van Halen song, you know, Pretty Woman, that sort of thing. <laughs> what have they done? It's useless. Why would you do this? Brilliant. Yeah, that's definitely true <laughs> at the time. Good yeah, because I didn't know this was this was them for me, and it's superb. What are your thoughts, lads, on my third voice? I love it. Uh, actually, I it's one it of too. my favourite Van Halen albums. I, I know it gets a load of load of crap off everyone, but because of the covers and because it's so short and because of the cover, but um, I, it's to me, it's got a, a sound that goes all the way through it, and and you can easily listen to it as a piece. I mean, I, I'm not so keen on dancing in the street, but the rest of it is great. It's the best it's version some, of Dancing in the Streets, without a doubt. Some great drumming and obviously some great guitar playing. Yeah. So, yeah. And I to introduce their father, Jan Van Halen, on clarinet as well. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant. Yeah. See, I love that too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good album. Has anyone got a copy of it there? I yeah. have, but uh, it's, I haven't got it here. Uh, I've got a copy. I think the inner cover's quite cool on this as well from memory. I should have dug it out. But, um, yeah, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't. I, I've got it, sorry, but I haven't I got it with me. Got, got, uh, mine ready. But yeah, great I album. Really sure. I'm mm -hmm. sure everyone will agree. It's um, yeah, it's a great fun to listen to this. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well done, Jam. Some good choices there. So um, let the controversy begin. So um, I maybe I've got a bit of controversy with this one in terms of top twelve. Um, I've picked and, and actually, 
gaps you you were right you talked about venom being a genre well i think 82 was starting to spin the genres within genre so we were starting to get uh, a different type of bands coming out uh yeah twisted sister and what's interesting about this one is this was on uh this was signed to a uk independent label yeah. we've been touring around the states forever this is on secret records um and um there's a documentary or film on Netflix, which Gappy got me to go and watch. That's brilliant, uh, isn't it? And it's so amazing good. how interesting, how hard they good. work to get to the point. So of, hard. To get to the point of actually getting this album out. Um, and there's some classic uh, there's some classic records on this, produced by Pete Way of UFO fame. Um, oh, wow, I really didn't know that. That's really, really interesting. Uh, what You Don't Know, great, great, um, great song. Uh, Sin After Sin, Shoot Them Down, which is... Um, which is a bit of an ACDC type vibe, which is brilliant. Destroyer under the blade, uh, tear it loose, which uh, fast steady um, from Motet does the second uh, guitar solo. So yeah, if you didn't remember know that. That's yeah. worth a listen. They were good friends with Motet. They did a did an appearance on the tube, and they were getting a bit of grief from the crowd because of the way that D looked. Um, you know, he was really flamboyant makeup. Lemmy came on stage, joined them, and the crowd went mental and. There you had Avi, a twisted sister born and loved in the UK after that. Um, a couple of the guys went to see them at Oxford in 85, I think it was. Uh, 84. Maybe 84. I couldn't 84, go on. Stay hungry tour. They were with brilliant. The, the loudest um, gig I'd ever been to, but there again, I was stood right at the front in front of the PA. So. And there's a great story. One of our mates who was on the front, where I, and I'm not going to mention his, his name. We have mentioned him before. Um, hilariously in between the songs was still headbanging when they stopped playing that's how loud it was <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway we digress so twisted sister the first album under the blade if you're not heard it check it out it's quite difficult to get the um the original copy on the secret label but definitely worth a listen it's a great great rock album for sure my next offering is um talking about genres within genres is uh motley crew and um this is uh, this one's actually a uh, Australian um, uh, copy, which was released in '82, and I'm sure we'll have lots of people commenting. It's on Electra, but on, on the funky label, which I really like. That we'll have lots of people commenting saying, "Oh, this was uh, this was released in '81." Well, well, it was on their own label on Leather Records. I think there were only 900 copies released, and then the following year it was released uh, worldwide yeah. and in the UK in 1982. Yeah. Um, for those of you who've seen the, uh, seen the video or the Netflix film, The Dirt, so Netflix, if you want to give us some free subscriptions for uh, advertising, give us a shout. But there's a, um, there's a brilliant um, bit, the bit uh, sort of quite early on in the uh, in the film where they do live wire and they tune down the guitars of Vince Neil and his girlfriend sitting in the sitting in the sofa watching them in this little apartment. And it's just brilliant. The riff's fantastic. And I think it just captures the time. Motley Crue have obviously, uh, through the 80s, went stratospheric. They're loved in the States and around the world. They spent most of their time really touring in the States. They spent uh, a bit of time in Japan. Not that I've been over here as much. We saw them all in the summer. A couple of other tunes to to pick out. Take Me to the Top, uh, Come and Dance, Starry Eyed. I love that. Piece of Your Action. I think this is a brilliant album. And this is a genre within a genre. So things were starting to change. This was a bit of glam coming back. And they've been influenced heavily by Hanno Rocks, and there were lots of bands that followed this post Motley Crue. You can think about, obviously, Guns N' Roses that came a few years later, and then all the Skid Rows and Bon Jovi's and everything else. But you know, they should be applauded for uh, for kicking off um, quite a thing back in the time. For me, this is a great album, probably one of the best in my opinion. I don't know if the guys have got anything else they want to add on that. I just love the cover. The cover's immense. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. How metal is that? It's just isn't that a take on encapsulates heavy metal, doesn't it? Isn't that, that a take on Sticky Fingers? I think it is a bit. Well, Andy Warhol did uh, design Sticky Fingers. Yeah. That was his uh, his design. But it, yeah, it does <laughs> it just look very much like Sticky Fingers. Yeah. But yeah, I love it. I think it's great fun. And if you're not heard, of, if you're not listened to uh, any of the early Motley Crue stuff, give this a go. The production's not brilliant, but the songs mm. are fantastic. Good drumming on this album. Yeah, well, he's a, he's a good drummer, isn't he? Tom? He's a good drummer. Yeah. Yeah, really good drummer. Right, next one uh, is a British act, and this, in a way, probably was sort of spawning the um, 
not the end of a sound. Well, maybe it was. They they were these guys were British uh, new wave of British heavy metal act, and this was a, a commercial offering from Tigers of Bangtan. Um, they were Whitley Bay's finest, so from the northeast of England, and um, I had this as a very early team. And I used to listen to this on my Walkman. I had this on tape as well. I used to listen to it religiously. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Rendezvous, um, Letter from LA. I um, mean, oh, it's, it's great fun, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. Love Potion Number no. 9, which John Sykes, of course, plays on, which we know. It's making a hell of a tash, that. That's yeah. a tash. Um, Paris by Air. Fantastic. Um, now, if you listen to this now, if you go go and listen to this, it is dated in parts, right? And there are bits that you might think, well, that sounds 1980s. But forget that and just listen to, this is great pop rock songs. They are fantastic. And it's great fun. I love it. Really great. And you can pick this one up at Record Fairs. You could get this between five and ten quid. And I really encourage you to do it. I've got that one as well, Gav. It's awesome. So um, any other comments on uh, on Tigers? Well, Ping -pong? yeah, I mean, that, that record, it's, 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 it's brilliant. It's iconic. For me, every song on that is a possible single. The harmonies and melodies exactly. they brought to play were out of this world. Um, I love Tigers of Pantan because I, I used to do a paper round when I was a child. I was about 11 and I did it in the, the local um, local paper shop. And one week, suddenly there were some singles, some records, some seven inches there. And I went through them. I was at like 11 and there was there was a one by Tigers of Pantan. I remember thinking... That's mental. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of them. Tigers of Panang. 30 pence. I bought it. Don't stop by. It was out in 981. I bought it. Took it home. It was classic. So I had a long <laughs> stat. That was my morning's wages. I, I mean, something can never change. I blew the, <laughs> blew the on. single by a band I'd never heard of that had a, a great name. So I, I'd loved them for a couple of years. And But yeah, this it's record is... Song. They're real foot tappers, aren't they? I think that's the point. You listen to it, you can't help tap your feet and sing along to it. I think it's great. Fun. All kept, and all, three all singles kept. off the album. You know? Yeah. Amazing. In those okay. days, to have three singles off an album is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's... Sure. Uh, um, and they also did Reading at the same... I've got a recording of them doing Reading, um, this lineup, and I think it must have been around the time that um, Love Potion was in the charts because the crowd are louder than the band when they're singing it back. <laughs> it's brilliant. But so, it's yeah, so they were on fire, and, uh, you know, I don't know what happened, but, uh, you know, very rarely do MCA... Recording artists breakthrough, same as yeah. Diamond Head. So I think they split up. I think about a year afterwards. I think that's where it all sort of started capitulating because I think they were they were musical differences. So that if anyone knows, please comment. Let us mm. know in the in in the comments. Well, they're still going now, but there's obviously yeah, a gap. not not as in, in the in the. They should have been much bigger than they were. I think. Yeah, this, this was a classic album, and it deserves a remix. Yeah, I, I think that. Yeah. Mutt Lang not, remix. Not a remaster, a remix. <laughs> yeah, a Mutt Lang remix, which would be awesome. Yeah, okay. yes, please. Well, look, that's my, that's my three. Um, let's go, Gav, if you can maybe take us through some of the best of the rest. Before we go to that, we know there are a couple of uh, Hanu Rocks albums released in, in 82 as well. So apologies for not putting them up. It's not We're not ignoring them. They will feature um, over the course of the next couple of uh, episodes because we are aware of how influential they were. Um, in some of those genres as we as we move through the 80s. So, again, just put your favourites in the comments later. But over to you, Gav. Yeah, well, from my side, uh, I guess the ones I'd want to comment on were Queen, because I was ready for this, being a massive Queen fan in the early days. And then, I must say, disappointed when it came out, because obviously they were chasing the whole nightclub scene and uh, on the chasing the, the dosh, I guess, after their number one, Another one bites the dust from the album before, and it really wasn't guitar-y enough. It wasn't real drums enough for me. Um, I do like quite a few songs on the album, but I just I don't like the production, you know. And when they hit you with body language as their single, I say no. So well, I've never heard of it. So no, yeah, they they did rock them up live for a Milton Keynes concert that is that exists, and they and it sounds a load better. You know, um, stay in power and stuff like that. But yeah, without labouring the point, not not great. Um, and also, their White Snake, I think, went off the boil a little bit. Bless them. Yeah, not their best. Yeah, not a fan of that album cover either. Um, I think they were starting to fragment a little bit from the classic lineup. And then the other one that goes into the 
yeah. why the hell didn't this band break through? That's your, your diamond head. Got your tour date. Yeah, Samo's got the old assault attack there. Yeah, it's got the tour yeah, date. I'm pass over to Jam for the uh, the MSG because that might shock a few people. My, yeah, just my apology. I, I had to pull this last. This is this. If I could have had four, this would have been my fourth, but I couldn't make room in my top three. So yeah, this I love, and I wish I could have had it in there, but I couldn't. So yeah, thoughts below. Yeah, Good. for people people that know what we've talked about before, I was a massive Rainbow and Motorhead fan. And for me, each one of these albums is probably the weakest album that either band produced. So not really my cup of tea. There's a few good songs on both of them, but but not not too much, unfortunately. It's Fast Eddie's last last album with uh, Motorhead. And uh, the Rainbow album had a few, well, a couple of good songs on it, but it really wasn't uh, anything on the on the previous one or the one that followed it, to be honest. Awesome. Okay, I think you've got a couple more on the next slide, Gav. Yeah, real quick, Gary Moore. Um, it's a good album, really good, good album. album. With terrible production. Yeah. Um, so that didn't make the the top twelve, unfortunately, but uh, deserves a. The Asia album's really good. I mentioned, yeah, I, I really love the Asia album. I got a little uh, picture disc of that for the um, only time will tell, and that. It's just scary that I've got all four of those, and you're like, oh god. I got too many records. Yeah, I've got the Vandenberg. I haven't got the, I haven't got the Hagar. Yeah, so you have to talk about box. that. Mm. Yeah, no, three lock box. It's a, it's fine. It's a good record, but yeah, <laughs> it's never going to make our top twelve. And I so think Vandenberg's gone back to that logo because he's doing some dates over here with that logo. Well, so he must be playing the old stuff, trying to yeah. uh, trying to ride that crest of a wave. Okay, he's going for the uh, going for the grey pound. I'm guessing. Not there's any grey on this pod. Anyway, let's uh, so that's the rest of the rest. Um, let's get on to yeah, um, a couple, yeah. let's get on to the top five. So uh, our resident um, Alan Freeman Jamo is going to count down from five to one. Over to you, my man. Yes, uh, it's getting trickier and trickier uh, for you. But today, uh, the official top five albums of May two for you here, as always, in reverse order. Uh, it's lonely at the top, but not for Tigers of Pantang, with The Cage in at number five. The Spirit has certainly guided us, it's Magnum with Chase the Dragon at number four. Three, 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 the number of the beast from Iron Maiden in at number three in the official top five albums of 1982 from Tales from the Parade. That is controversial. <laughs> Can't live, can't live without them. Yes, it's Blackout from the most awesome Scorpions in at number two. Which means that at number one in the official Tales from the Power Age top five albums of 1982, it's Screaming for Vengeance by Judas Priest. It was a close call oh, yeah, in 1980 yeah. with British Steel, but this time they've made it to number one. Congratulations to Rob and the boys. Over to you, Deal. Yeah, well done. Congratulations yeah. to Judas Priest. And hey, well look, done. looking at those, all five are great albums, right? But if you had those top three albums, they could and probably are in the top three heavy metal albums of all time. They are absolute classic albums. And if you only own, only own those three albums in, in a heavy metal genre, you'd be really happy, I think. So, look, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure there'll be a whole bunch of you disagree. There'll be lots of albums we haven't included. So please put that in the comments, get involved, tell us your top five, um, talk through your memories from 1982 as well. But while you're doing that, please give us a subscribe, hit the house bell. It helps the algorithms, as you know, and reminds you when we're uh, releasing the next one. You can find us on Facebook on Tales from the Power Age. You can find us on X, Tales from the Power Age at TTFTPR, online at www.talesfromthepowerage.com and you can get some merch from redbubble.com merchandise. 82 was a brilliant year yet again. I hope you enjoyed that. Cheers, guys. Brilliant. Cheers. Thanks a lot, people. Wow. See you later. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye.